let's focus on health comments. It's been suggested uh, previously in a variety of different angles. One, A, a lot of people here are tracking uh, a hell of a lot of their, uh, of their own data. Uh, we have had um, a few people here purchase the glycan age test. We have a few people on different a variety of different diets, on a variety of different uh, supplements, on like metformin and so on and so forth. So is there something that we could even all do together where we pool our data in a way where it makes sense? But then also, um, more largely speaking, is there a, a way in which it would make sense to do that for society in general or for a subset of society uh, where basically we find a structure in which people can share their data um, in a way where they actually have uh, somewhat of a stake in, uh, in the way that it, uh, that it will be used uh, downstream. Um, and I know that a few of you are already involved in a few of those projects. So I'm super, super eager to, uh, to hear about those and potential complications. And then uh, discuss maybe a way in, uh, in which we can maybe ha make it happen here or if there's other projects that people should be joining. But I won't, uh, I won't say too much here uh, because we actually have a, a few people that uh, I think uh, have thought much, much more about this. So uh, I would say that perhaps, Brian, you could uh, start off uh, by sharing some thoughts about uh, you know, the importance of actually ending the tragedy of, I of idle data um, that would help us define the problem a little bit. And I'm going to share the whole list of uh, introductory talks in here. After Brian, we have a few more um, uh, kind of intro remarks. And then I'm hoping that uh, we can open it up for discussion. Does that sound good? Uh, Alison, before you go on, um, just yeah. one thing from Wilbury. Um, so um, I see we've got someone on the call that I'm very pleased to see, but I don't think I've been on these things before. I don't know how he found out about them even, but it's important to mention this for, the, for everybody. So Ron Kahansky is here. Um, now, he is a senior um, uh, grant administrator in the National Institute on Aging and the, the, the Division of Aging Biology, and um, uh, you know, a very forward-looking and um, progressive and honest thinker and so on. So I'm delighted to see him here, but I think we all ought to know that, especially because his name disappeared at the point where his video came on. I'm not quite sure why that happened. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, we have an audience here that could be very important in terms of taking what we say here to people in the corridor of the power. For sure. So uh, uh, we have to thank Keith for that. Uh, thank you, Ron, uh, Ron for, for joining. And I love your Magritte hat uh, in the back uh, of the room. Uh, very, very nice. Um, but uh, I think uh, you, uh, you know, voice the preference to perhaps like, you know, first check this out, what this container is about. You're very, very, very free to comment whenever you'd like. We'd love your comments. I don't want to put you on the spot at all, but uh, it's really, 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 really nice to see you here. Feel free to chime in whenever. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Aubrey, for uh, mentioning my presence, I guess, <laughs> and exaggerating the importance of my position. I know a lot of the people on the call, um, I'll call everybody out by name. Uh, this is, for me, a learning uh, process. So I'll be listening, and my philosophy is, if I'm talking, I'm not listening, and that means I'm not learning. So I'll just listen. Okay, okay. I, I feel like... Yes, yes, we would all be learning. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Let, let's see. Maybe we'll just take a moment of silence later and to kind of entice Bon to speak up a little. Let's let's see. For now, let's start. Um, we have like a really, I think, a host of fantastic little intro talks uh, that we can, uh, you know, that we can bounce off of afterwards. And perhaps uh, um, uh, you'd like to give us a start, Brian, and then we we'll take it from there. Uh, you know, I'd rather listen, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I'll speak very, very briefly. Um, I, I feel like there are so many more knowledgeable people here um, than I that I, I think I, 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 would, I would do best to maybe speak for two or three minutes and just kind of try to frame the problem a little bit. Although, Alison, you already did a marvelous, marvelous job of that. Um, I, I use this somewhat dramatic term, the tragedy of idle data, really quite precisely. I do mean tragedy in the classical sense of something that results in a negative outcome that cannot be undone. Now, it's not that the data can't be made non-idle, but it's that the lives lost by its having been idle for so long cannot be regained. That, that's, that's something that really struck me a few years ago that I wanted to try to do something about. And by way of example, imagine that the people in Framingham, Massachusetts in the late 40s had decided to start collecting data, it was not so easy, on their cholesterol um, and blood pressure and took notes on when they exercised and how much they ate and so forth and various health outcomes, um, blood pressure and so on. And the data was just sitting there and maybe people 
got some ideas about what they could do as individuals, um, but that these um, dramatic conclusions that could have been drawn were not drawn. And compare that to what actually happened, which is that the Framingham Heart Study was launched, uh, largely because of uh, Roosevelt's death. And I would say it's not an exaggeration to say that the Framingham Heart Study saved, has saved millions of lives through the um, insights into what drives hypertension and heart disease. So what is the equivalent today of the data that would have been gathered and wasted if the Framingham Heart Study hadn't been launched when it comes to diseases of aging? Well, we have, I don't know how many biohackers, as we're called, or health optimizers, um, hundreds of thousands, maybe close to a million with rich data sitting in their computers, not being pooled. Um, now, we do have these great large studies. Uh, we have um, all of us um, the, the launched by the U.S. government. We have um, the U.K. Biobank, and these are very large studies, and they're generating, or the, in the case of all of us, will generate very, very useful insights. But I've been trying to figure out how we can bring the data that's already been gathered by so many of us together and draw scientific conclusions from it. Now, there are tons of problems. Um, the data is sloppy, it's messy, it's not standardized. Um, we have to worry about patient privacy. Um, but to try to get a sense of, really basically try to, to try to learn more about some of these problems, I actually started a longitudinal study. Um, the, the, I have this research group. It, my name is appearing as Emerging Longevity Ventures. That's my venture capital company, but I'm the, the director of a group called Vitality and Aging Research Group. And we've started a couple of studies. One of them is a longitudinal study um, that's unfortunately been put on hold uh, for a number of reasons, mostly COVID-19. But um, in starting the study, one of the, one of the problems that I came across um, is that when you try to avoid this, when you try to pool data to avoid this tragedy of, of idle data on my computer, you sometimes end up with the tragedy of siloed data. Um, and it's perfectly understandable because when you start a study, I have now learned, it takes a lot of money and resources. And you, you either get a grant from the government or you have to try to monetize it and monetizing it in a way that is going to be difficult to make it um, compatible with uh, free and open sharing. That, that's a kind of an obvious problem. So, um, so anyway, there are lots of things that need to be worked out. And I know that um, both Kevin and Keith have thought through this quite carefully. Um, so I think at this point, I will follow Ronald Kohansky's wisdom and start listening. Lovely, thank you so much. We have the problem lined out. Um, and I think for now, I just uh, kind of right away want to give it over to Keith. And I think Keith even has a few slides to share. Sure, yes. And uh, Brian has, has teed up nicely. So let me see if I can share my keynote here. The first thing is, as it's worth noting here, we live in a modern age with cell phones that we were carrying massive supercomputers in our pockets. And this is now being able to collect a lot of basic biomarker data. And this is changing the way things are happening right now. So for example, Apple just a few weeks ago had their worldwide developer conference where they announced some significant upgrades to a couple of built-in kits they have on the phone. Health kit, which aggregates a bunch of health kit data, care kit, which presents uh, nice uh, user experience ways to, to uh, access and add to that data. And notably here, research kit, which is specifically designed to facilitate essentially crowdsourced clinical trials with uh, you know, built-in methods to gather informed consent and self-report surveys uh, and all that. And even has some built-in tests that you can perform right on your iPhone, notably uh, cognitive uh, disability tests, dementia-related tests. Um, and uh, this is already being used in systems like um, Brian had mentioned, the uh, NIH All of Us Initiative, Biobank. Um, and, you know, this is starting to emerge into a healthcare commons where people can contribute to, to that with data that they're getting every day. Uh, one question that's worth noting here that some of the later speakers might talk about is this brings into an issue of sort of privacy, 
uh, versus public data. And the current pandemic is actually, I'm seeing newscasters and such talk about this issue a lot in relation to uh, COVID-19 because people have been talking about ideas like, oh, should we make some sort of governmental registry where you where you track your COVID-19 status? And then that's, you know, provoking a lot of people to go, no, wait, we're going to have the evil empire. You know, so there's a lot of conversations here. Uh, and it's worth noting that some of these concerns uh, can be mitigated by smart applications of current technology like uh, blockchain technology, which can allow people to control and even sell in some cases their own data that can be anonymized in a way where you can still get the benefit of being able to aggregate data and, and do studies off of it while still protecting everyone's uh, privacy. So I think this is going to come into play in certain countries like Estonia, for example, are kind of leading the way on this. Uh, I believe 99% of their healthcare records are uh, in this kind of format. But obviously, blockchain is like a, a super deep dive topic that we can talk about at another time if you want to. Uh, so I'll move on from there. And I'm assuming Kevin might get into this as well. But some benefits that will happen of having an effective health commons are to what Brian said, basically creating ways to make use of previously just uh, N equals one self-experimentation data by being able to put it in some sort of standardized, verif verifiable way uh, that is normalized so that the data can be used with each other. This in turn will provide uh, potentials to test therapies via crowdsourcing that don't traditionally have profit motives in the usual sense. Uh, you know, there's a lot of therapies, for example, uh, for example, like the flickering light therapy that might be good for uh, dementias, right? You're not going to be patenting a light bulb. It's going to be hard to make money off of this. So these therapies don't typically go as far as they could. Uh, but if we have a crowdsourcing angle of this that's facilitated by a health commons, that can enable that. And another thing that's a downstream effect of this is that this can potentially enable massive cohort sizes, which allows you to do clinical trials in sort of a different way, instead of trying to just use uh, 20 people and wringing as much statistical power out of, as you can out of them with double blind trials, et cetera. If you have a cohort of 10 million, you might be able to loosen some aspects of the protocol to, because you're getting the statistical power back from having tons of people. And then you can do things like maybe 100,000 people do this dose and 100,000 people do that dose, et cetera. Uh, so again, I'm assuming Kevin might talk about this. So I'll uh, skip ahead. And I want to mention here that a key aspect that this runs directly into for us is the issue of biomarkers. Is there a way that we can piggyback on an existing or emerging healthcare common system to basically implement aging biomarkers that can become part of pretty much every trial so that everything always has that sort of secondary indication for how it's affecting the aging process. And this is actually where I have a little bit of a prescription of maybe how we can do this. And it's coming from my background in building massive IT systems. Uh, so I'm not a biomarker expert, so I'll be curious what everyone has to think about this part. So as Brian had mentioned, one of the issues that I see a lot is I've, I've had a conversation over the past six years with dozens of different groups that are all trying to set up something like this healthcare common system. They maybe have a couple of proprietary tests they're selling. You know, basically they're doing their own special brew. They're using different sets of biomarkers for the same kind of inter interventions or formatting their data in proprietary ways that don't interoperate with each other. And as a very uh, timely case in point here, I just received an email like two days ago, and some of you probably did as well, from the XPRIZE Longevity Initiative, which I very much support. But right at the head of that email was basically like, hey, what biomarkers should we use? Um, and that kind of speaks to a problem. The fact that, we're, that that's the key question indicates that we might act, what we might actually need right now is a grand standardization initiative similar to what happened to birth the internet after the ARPANET. Basically, uh, you know, international councils were convened and it was basically like, hey, everybody, no one is leaving this room for like two weeks until we agree upon a set of standards, a set of goals that everyone is trying to reach. And we all don't have to work on the same thing, but you know, Bob, you work on this part, Sven, you work on this part. And the main thing they were agreeing upon is the interoperability format so that everyone could take a piece and build to the same standard so that every individual project helps the whole movement, right? Same thing happened with HTTP, you know, that everyone's using right now, you know, to get the Zoom. Um, 
And there are similar standards right now that are emerging, like one is called FIRE, or Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource. Uh, and this is trying to set a standard. Uh, you know, Apple's HealthKit is, is using this, for example. And a way that maybe we can translate the same sort of thing to our field is, this is gonna sound glib, but just give me a second. You know, if we had such a council or grand, you know, government-led initiative, uh, basically a lot of this can be theory crafted. The first thing we would need to do is agree on some desired metric for biological age that if achieved would be unequivocally useful as a diagnostic for any clinical trial. You know, whatever that is, like uh, here as a rough example, let's say our goal accuracy is to have this metric be able to predict the chronological age of a normal person not undergoing any specific therapy with a mean absolute error of plus or minus one year with a correlation of this or that, whatever that is, we can decide what is the value that we need to be ubiquitously universal. Then you can work backwards from that and say, okay, once this goal is determined, what types of biomarkers do we think are minimally necessary so that the aggregate would hit those goals? And it's important to note that we can math that out to some degree without even these things necessarily existing yet. And then you further walk backwards and say, okay, if we have a goal physiological metric of this, what sub-physiological metrics like six-minute walk tests, lung capacity, visual, et cetera, can together meet that goal of the physiological goal that could then supply the component into the goal metric, right? And then you ensure that everybody who's working on their own projects is working into an interoperable format that will hit whatever they're working on in this pantheon. And what this allows, if you can do it, is that eventually, if we do hit those metrics sufficiently and we continue to do this process year after year and iterating in 10 years, we have the goal metric reached. Then as we go on, different subsets of all this data might be able to fill that. And this is where the healthcare commons really comes in because you might say, hey, if we have a trial where we're collecting stool samples and blood samples or whatever, this combination of 10 things will be the right one to the goal. But what if I'm doing a crowdsource trial and all I can get is physiological biomarker data? What's the best set that I can use to get the best metric out of it, right? And then finally, one final knock-on benefit of doing it this way is that it allows non-obvious stakeholders to see how they can be involved and maybe work with the government. To give an example, um, you know, there may, may or may not be certain companies in the entertainment industry that have, for example, capabilities to track physiological biomarkers that blow out of the water any biotech company. And if there was something clearly specified like this, that company could look at it and go, hey, I got that component here, right? So again, I might not know at all what I'm talking about because I'm not a biomarker expert, but as someone who builds massive systems that manages data from millions of people. We do things like this all the time. And I think it's possible. <laughs> so that's basically my spiel. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Only this is awesome. Steve, you raised your hand right away. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, uh, if, we, if we pick a biomarker or biomarker set and then use it in practice, what we're going to be doing is optimizing the biomarkers instead of optimizing aging. And that would be a horrible mistake. Um, the, uh, we need to have competition. Oh, you, mean like, you mean like Goodhart's law? Or? Well, we need to have competition for what are the best biomarkers. And you can't pick one as a standard and then have, have competition. You need to have a, a level playing field where all the bi different biomarkers are competing against each other so that um, as our understanding of things changes, we don't get stuck with old technology that ends up um, being a dead end. And um, I've, I've been tracking biomarkers for 30 years, looking at the science and, and this whole issue of how to tap into our ability to measure biomarkers and assessment of aging. And um, everything has changed. The stuff that we looked at 30 years ago may not be wrong, but it was limited. And I think that we're seeing that in medicine as a trend for hundreds of years that things that we thought were right to prove to be wrong and that um, the 
expert opinions that we tend to get at any point in time end up not being, we end up investing in them to an extent that's more about the egos and the standing that that person has um, in the field rather than an honest critical appraisal of the pros and cons of their arguments relative to everybody else's arguments. Amen. Yeah, I would uh, like I think to, that, yeah. um, to just add my perspective. I come from the telecom background where we're all about standardization. So 4G, 5G, 3G, we've been through all of that and triple, IEEE and, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm familiar with that and it has to be that way for telecom because it's an engineering problem uh, versus uh, science, life science, it's so much we don't know. And it's an evolving field and it's longevity is not an engineering pro uh, problem to solve at this point it's just because there's so much unknown so i would say that uh, a pure standard driven process may not work here uh, you know somewhere to allow new discovery new biomarkers to surface is uh, a better approach yeah I, I have a clear response to that i understand that consideration but that's actually you're making the point that I was trying to make is that the whole point there is that the process and the end metrics is really what you're trying to standardize, not exactly how you get there. So the whole point is that you can iterate and then what, maybe when you do an actual trial, you'd need to like freeze things at a certain level of like we're agreeing on these metrics and going ahead. But if you have a health common system and you can then pull that data and look to see, okay, does this combination of metrics accurately predict the chronological age of non-intervened people? You can iterate on the whole system continuously. And it, because again, you, you're totally correct that it's biology is not software, right? But it is actually a very analogous uh, situation to certain IT problems. Let me give you an example. If you have uh, a system where you're gathering user behavior data from an entertainment program, for example, right? you have a lot of data points that you're trying to use to see what's the, what's the best way that I can see, like, does the user like this or where they spend their time in this, right? And you have like 50 different things, you know, even things eventually like facial sentiments and stuff, right? And then this is what happens. It's like, you have these 50 things you like, these two actually turn out to be like, not a great predictor. We're gonna downrank that. These ones are working really well. Let's focus on that. So it's like you keep iterating and you can keep testing because at the end of the day, you can ask the question to the aggregate system, does this combination now of the latest best versions of these markers, when I look at the data in this way, does it accurately predict you know, the base case? And then you can refine yeah, over time. I think Cosmo also wanted to give us two cents and I'll just, oh yeah, you already unmuted, go for it. Hey everybody. So I just I just literally woke up two minutes ago. So sorry if this comes off as a little blah. But um, yeah, I, I wanted to share a little bit of insight because I I actually built a common system like this back in late 2012, <laughs> and then I I spent about seven years building it up. And at the at the peak we had about 10,000 users, and this system I, I put the link to it in the chat. We had people contributing their genome data, their Fitbit data, their other wearable data. We had Jawbone back in the day when Jawbone was a thing. We, we eventually created an app for this project that would let people track their diet with uh, photographing of foods. And I, I learned a lot of key lessons when I built out this information common system uh, at, that, I, that I really wanted to share, kind of the key lessons. Namely, um, if you're living off the land like this, if you're living off of a land where you, you want to um, gather, gather people's health data for purposes of doing research, one of the best things that you can do is identify the types of data out there that are, that are so unbelievably ubiquitous that you'll find the most users to have uh, uh, donatable data to you. So for example, at the end of, the, at the end of this seven year run for this nonprofit project that I ran, we had about 10,000 people donate their genome data, but a, a surprisingly tiny fraction of those users would go on to donate, say, their Fitbit data, even though there are way more Fitbits out there than there are people with genome sequencing data. So what I, what I learned is that it's actually surprisingly difficult to find those subsets of users that have um, 
really commoditize direct to consumer health data and get them all in the same place and get them all to do the same thing at the same time. And that's, that's something that I never really learned how to get around. Uh, governmental projects, however, like the UK Biobank and the All of Us initiative, the, the, the primary thing that they have to their benefit is the fact that they have given grants to thousands of hospitals nationwide and they've got their little fingers in all those medical centers. And they're effectively um, granting the citizens that participate in that science free genome sequencing. They're, they're, they're coming to the table with something to give the user for free. And, and that's the upper hand that they have. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I think uh, Brian had a comment, and then we'll wrap it up with the presentations by Kevin and Hong, and then uh, we'll move to discussion, OK? Yeah, Cosmo, I agree. I agree. The, the other upper hand um, when it comes to something like the UK Biobank is that they have access to patient data you know, from the NHS. Um, so, but, but anyway, it, it's, I, I was, I've um, been speaking with the, um, the people at the Personal Genome Project um, up at, uh, at Harvard, and they it's an incredibly cool project and they've um, run into the same problem. People are just, they're being sequenced and sometimes it's sponsored, um, not always, um, but it just to get them to upload phenotype data, just it's been really, really hard. Um, and this is an incredibly cool project and there are all kinds of advantages to being part of it. I mean, you could get to take part in the studies. You, eventually you could be selected to have really cool expensive tests done for free, but nonetheless, people are just not following through um mm -hmm. so it's it's a problem um and I, I don't really know how to solve it we have to motivate people in some way all of us has i think a little more than three hundred thousand people who have now joined um i don't know how many of those does someone here know how many of those have actually gone through the surveys and entered health data in any way I, 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 so so i've i've um i've almost become a member of the all of us team so many times now they 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 kept almost hiring me and then that never happened and basically from the start of the all of us initiative i had a technology stack that i built on my own and i was like hey all of us you know work with me and so i i know a lot of their principles pretty closely actually and it, it's it's a tiny number of of people who have actually gone through and donated phenotypic data at this point a very yeah. tiny number. By, by yeah. far, the UK Biobank is way ahead of the US government in terms of getting this type of project done. The other thing I'll say about the, the, the Harvard uh, Personal Genome Project, however, they, they kind of rebranded, as you may know, they're now called the Open Humans Initiative. They have a really great platform if you haven't seen it yet. Openhumans.org. Yeah, no, I know that. Have they rebranded or they've split? They're, well, they, they, they effectively rebranded. They're, they're the same people. Okay, right, but, oh. but the PGP still exists separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, right, got it, got it. Lovely. So anyway, sorry, we got a... Yeah, I think you shared so, a link to that uh, in the chat, Cosmo, and perhaps uh, we can uh, move to Kevin, then Hong, uh, and then uh, we'll, uh, and then perhaps Steve has a few critical remarks, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, I just want to make sure that we get the intro comments uh, all lined up. Kevin, uh, Kevin, you. you'll say a few words about Open Cures. Yeah, very briefly. Yeah. Um, so Open Cures is a startup that went from a nonprofit to a for-profit to a for-benefit to a hybrid to a whatever the fuck I can get it to do so that we don't uh, die of aging. Um, but basically, I'm just going to share one um, screen, or if I can, uh, uh, just one guiding thing that has been, uh, there it is, OK. So finishing off my PhD at the Buck Institute, I'm sitting in the mass spectrometry lab and I'm remembering my experience going through cancer and realizing that as far as the customer is concerned, minimizing time is the only goal. We can talk about all the ways to execute things, how much money and how much energy we can siphon out of the system, you know, and put in our pockets and our egos and our publications. But at the at the we are all feeding off of the suffering of individuals who need uh, these therapies, and they need to go from a state of less health to a state of greater health. Now that actually requires an intervention and a whole bunch of input of resources, but that's not the end of the story. Those interventions then need to go ahead and produce samples. Those samples then need to be assayed. 
But it doesn't matter about this intervention cycle in general. It has to be guided by intelligence. But if we're not producing good, accurate, solid scientific data, unbiased data, like uh, to Stephen's point, um, then we're not going to... Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to take care of it later. I'm on, I'm on phone right now. Pardon me. I'm sorry. Just a sec, please. I've got a package from FedEx that was just returned because of no customs document. So, uh, All right. or how about we move? Let's move on to Hong and, and, and uh, we can come back to me in a minute. Sounds lovely. Hong, take it away. I, I'm taking the liberty to unmute you if I can, unless you want to do it. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Many familiar faces. Um, just a little update on, on, on myself. Uh, my, my day job now is to uh, focus on getting a COVID vaccine and therapeutic out in a timely fashion. And that's a, a, a you know, big project at the moment. So my hobby and passion in the last 10 years has been optimizing health and extend health span. And so, so in the past, um, I've organized um, a like longevity comment and uh, my website at that time, and it's still active, is Elon Life, E-L-O-N, life.com. So what I wanted to do is, um, you know, not only just to learn about the latest and greatest, but put some of it to use um, when we deem that the risk and reward ratio is uh, greater than average. And so that takes a lot of research. And instead of self-experimenting and just sharing it um, on, on an ad hoc level, maybe we could organize um, some some activities based on you know the risk reward ratio and i'm all about that because obviously there's some really new uh, treatment and um, but it might be just so unproven so there there's been like track records on safety and efficacy on some of these things uh, such as exo exosome and um, maybe even like stem cell therapy and some others and people here are very much up to date and knowledgeable. But getting the getting to action, actually get it organized, get the logistics sorted out and uh, getting it delivered to everybody who wants to try it is um, actually pretty uh, daunting. Uh, it takes a, a lot of concerted effort. So I'm still like, because of my daytime job and uh, I'm, I'm looking for volunteers to help me carry through some of the things that I was uh, working on. One of which was the exosome, you know. Also there's, um, I would say for female, <laughs> there's some vanity as well. I, I would like to like, you know, do some of the cosme uh, cosmetics experiments as well. Uh, skin and hair and uh, all of that through different technologies and so that that was the intent and also the group discount and negotiate really good price because exosome can be really costly uh, if you do one off uh, so that was uh, elonlife.com and I would like to continue um, another thing that that um, I'm working uh, Actually, it's kind of related to COVID um, because of, uh, Cosmo, you mentioned something about the UK uh, health data being available. And recently, UK did 136,000 uh, COVID patients that are on uh, in genome, and they were trying to figure out what genes make uh, people susceptible. So this afternoon, I actually happened to be talking with the with a, a genome company with the AI platform. They've been at it for 10 years. And from what I, my research, they are the most comprehensive, um, they give the most comprehensive interpretation or, or annotation of the whole genome uh, of any um, companies out there. So I'm in discussion with them to see if they can tap into that UK data uh, and see if they can come up with unique insights on 
you know, COVID either vaccine or therapeutic. But do you know, Cosmo, is that available? Is that data publicly available? Uh, the UK Biobank data is available to anybody, um, but you have to apply to get it. You have to pay like an administrative fee. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, sweet. Thanks so much for sharing. And please post any relevant links here in the chat. I see Kevin has received uh, the return package. Uh, maybe you want to start off again. All right. Sure. OK, so I'll, I won't belabor the point. But basically, from a, from a patient's perspective, the whole point of, of health technology development is because someone is sick and they would like something as soon as possible. And a lot of the industry is made, making money off of health technology development, not the sale of actual products and services to people who, who actually pay for them. Um, so how do we accelerate things? And involving the customer is a really good idea. And involving the customer so that they can provide their data, uh, the value of their data, and focus it on the problems that they're interested in is a good idea. So Open Cures so far is basically a middleman. We're acting as a meta sort of organizer so that uh, average human beings who are proactive about their health can access mass spectrometry. They can give us a blood sample, we can send it off, we can give them, we do untargeted metabolomics or targeted proteomics, and we can start generating hundreds, potentially thousands of data points for individuals. We give them some level of interpretation, but they are acting as a self-directed researcher, so they take responsibility for the results. We give them workshop environments so that they can all sit around together. It's not this one-on-one -on -one incredibly personal and intense experience that you have with your, with your doctor. So it takes a little bit of the sting out of uh, getting this data or the fear of it, because it's really just lifestyle data, there really isn't an awful lot of uh, binary, you're going to die kinds of things out of it. It means, well, oh, you should be taking more omega-3, you know, my goodness, you know, you, you might want to try some probiotics, you know, it's really very, uh, and people walk away from these workshops after getting their data, feeling very, very empowered, and knowing things that they didn't know before. Um, this should be standard of care stuff, really, frankly. It should be, doctors should be prescribing these kinds of things for people for, in terms of prevention. We do know enough about a lot of these biomarkers <clears throat> to tell people when they're starting to drive over the center line and, you know, give them course correction. So we've got over 120, now 123 individuals have provided over 230 samples. We've worked with a couple of uh, companies that have been testing sort of like blood flow moderation, blood flow restriction, which is uh, something that people build bodybuilders and we're actually working with the VA um, uh, who are uh, working with the wounded warriors, looking at different interventions, but we're just trying to tell whether or not, and I don't see aging as something, there are really no aging biomarkers, there's, there's health biomarkers, and uh, aging is just a loss of health with time. And we need this kind of universal standard, of course, but there's going to be a whole bunch of different biomarkers. So having unbiased, um, untargeted metabolomics and proteomics and these kinds of technologies available. So how do we drag scientists who are very siloed, very focused on their own uh, research, kicking and screaming to a table to uh, create standards? And because this is really the most uh, biggest barrier, I think, to a degree, and I'm working right now with FASEB. I'm on their task force, and they are trying to reinvent themselves in an era of COVID. And they're looking at different revenue streams, and apparently they think I've got, I might have something to say. And uh, it just so happens that I'm also working with the International Olympic Committee. And so FASEB wants to develop, and I told FASEB, well, one of the things you can offer your members and potentially your member societies is a single voice in creating data standards for science in general. And they said, oh, for the past two years, we've been talking about this with the NIH, and unfortunately, or the three years, but unfortunately, the lead person uh, champion uh, died, and it's been left fallow. And uh, so now we're picking that up. So they have the potential to bring 28 organizations together with over 100,000 members to talk about data standards, sharing data, and I think it's important. Uh, and I would love it in a pie in the sky, completely uh, 
unbelievable dream world that the International Olympic Committee, yeah, would, would, would uh, I've talked to the lead scientist, uh, Yanis Petsitalkas, he's a Greek guy, I can't remember his last name particularly, but he's been working with the Olympic Committee for 20 years and he has been trying to get the Olympic uh, board to measure athletes in a multi fashion for over 20 years. And he said he's been uh, receiving nothing but resistance and nobody wanted to go that direction. So, but he said in the past four months since COVID, he's made more progress with this uh, argument um, of testing athletes from every biological dimension possible than he did in the previous 20 years. And so there, the International Olympic Committee uh, scientists, I believe, are open to the suggestion that uh, with FASEB, who wants to present a proposal to the NIH, who they already had ongoing discussions with, for the creation of data standards. And my God, if we could actually get that, the International Olympic Committee to use their sort of honest broker ombudsman sort of thing to reach into other countries, we could actually have a global scientific discussion on creating data standards between all countries. If we could do that, if I can do that before I die, I tell you, that would be an amazing achievement and be able to push all of science forward because when I went into the, the lab at the Buck Institute and I still saw people pasting graphs with handwritten notes and you know pen marks and things like that, and I thought, oh my God, we are, this is, this is just not gonna work. So anyway, so this is what I'm dedicated to. Open Cures is dedicated to helping individuals generate data on their own. They own their data and uh, I'm not doing research with their data. They have the capacity to focus the value of their data on the problems that they want, either individually or in aggregate, and let the market decide what the hell has to happen with the data, instead of everybody trying to own someone else's data. Let the people who own the data actually focus the value of the data on the problems that they wanted, maybe the cancer patients and the Parkinson's patients and the Alzheimer's patients, all of their data that they generate, maybe if they were allowed to focus the value of their data, we would see faster progress. So I'll just, okay. and I hope, I hope we all can get together and, and fix this because the biggest barrier is people, healthy people, not feeling the same sense of urgency that somebody who's sick is, feels. And how do we sit on our hands and wait and congratulate ourselves for how smart we are. You know, I'm, uh, um, anyway, I'm a kid. I'm waiting, that's, that's I'm a... waiting for, I'm waiting for Creon's Amen here, but <laughs> in the absence of that, I think that's a fantastic segue into a few of the points that Steve, uh, I think, wanted to raise. So, uh, Steve, if you, I want to point out a few obstacles and, uh, and suggestions there. Yeah, um, I've, my general feeling is that uh, the time is not full yet for this kind of issue. And uh, one comment was made about their, uh, about incentives. And I think that fundamentally the job is like, you know, developing a technology for herding cats. And I can see that there's one thing. I mean, it's not a problem for us to have protocols and have variations on protocols. And so that, you know, different kinds of data can be classified in certain ways that lend itself towards analysis and, and high throughput processing. But the fundamental limitation that I see is that we don't have access yet to a generalized um, analysis engine. And one that would be able to look at things like um, incomplete data and look at um, variations among different standards in terms of, you know, units of, of a number and um, the, the particular lab that performed that test. Um, and that, that would give us an incentive for the sharing of information because if some company wanted to organize this and develop a search, in, not a search engine, an analysis engine, a correlational engine, um, then that would be an incentive. Everybody would have an incentive to donate data because they can't get the um, analysis done unless they donate the data. So in a sense, a service is being provided that's unique and it would drive the market, at least in the early um, cat herding stage of the process where everybody who is participating are innovators and 
they were hoping to get to the point when they become, you know, we can reach out to early adopters. So, um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, um, vaguenesses and inaccuracies and stuff that, you know, a straightforward um, analysis would be uh, challenged by like missing data points and, and the fact that people cycle in and out of their, um, uh, their uh, dedication and their participation in certain kinds of um, protocols. Um, so, um, you know, it's great. Do you, to, do you, do you see like, no way in which to incentivize people? Yeah. Well, there's yeah, always the public good side of it that, you know, always appeals to some people. So, so what, I, what we can do is the data collection at the bench needs to be as, so when I, as soon as I generate a data point or a machine produces a data point, it needs to be made as available to other people who can use it as quickly as possible, as long as it's got some quality control and some values available to it. An electronic lab notebook I mean, like I said, electronic lab, we're still using paper notebooks for the most part in a lot of labs. And the data that's generated and used and paid for by public funding should be collected in one central server location. There should, and the NIH is really, I think, the only entity that has the capacity to, you know, strong arm this uh, sort of data Thing. And I don't know, I think there would be a revolt. But I mean, how did GenBank actually get, get started? Well, Craig Venter said he wanted to patent the human genome. And then, you know, a whole bunch of scientists decided they were going to not let him do that. Kevin, that's not the problem that I was um, talking about. So sure. for example, let's say you've got um, a way to anonymize data and you're talking to doctor's data and to um, Genova and one, group does um, red blood cell analysis with um, um, spun down cells that are not sure. washed and the other one does it with cells that are sure. washed. Yeah. How do you develop um, an analysis that is able to take somebody's data where there's both tests and sure. interpret it in a way? I get it, I get it, yeah. I yeah, think that uh, the yeah, I just wanted to reply to that. I think that those are actually really great concerns, Stephen. And the one point that I want to make about that is it might not be easy, but solving those problems or coming up with workshopable solutions to those problems is is clear how you would do that in Iterator. I'm going to come exactly. up with just a random random example right here, right? Like it's a money problem like, rather than a technology problem. Yeah, or like let's say you you split you samples are, and you send it to both companies, and that that gives you what you need to know yeah. to make that interpretation. Yeah, and I don't know if there would be a way to like do do what I'm about to say in an inoffensive way, but like you could almost have some sort of like you know p-value hacking likelihood metric based on how many retractions you know like and weight things accordingly. You see what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I think I think the, the, the exact same problem exists where you're just comparing blood results from a phlebotomy versus blood results from a spot from a blood cart. From you know you have major problems and everything has to be validated and all the same. So which is why blood cards aren't used and why blood flow that much, at least, and not yet. So all of this work, this real grunt work, uh, comparing methods of obtaining data from different types of samples with different methodologies, it's incredibly complicated. You're right, Stephen, completely. But and, the uh, analysis itself, though, is I think the motivation that we're looking at to get this through the early adopters into the, uh, into the early adopter market, and that motivation is fundamentally laziness. If you have to build a spreadsheet, put all your data in it, and analyze it yourself, how many hours or man days have you invested in that analysis? Yeah, so that's basically what OpenCure's platform we're developing. It's supposed to be a biomedical, generic biomedical data storage and analysis platform so that everybody is given a calculator. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There will be standard statistical analysis, but then you wind up with the more fundamental problem of the fact that people can't even agree on what units to use sometimes and what ranges to use and what populations do you use to compare your results with and it becomes sort of like a throw up my hands and just just try and collect good solid data and know what the accuracy of the number is that's being stored and then worry about 
everything, all the normalization, the standardization. Yeah, w one point here why I, I think physiological biomarker data, I think is almost like our Trojan horse here, as in, as far as the laziness components and the, the likelihood of the metrics being accurate. Um, this is something that's going to become gathered ubiquitously. Like, just one random example here. Uh, augmented reality glasses are going to become standard in the next couple of years. Apple is going to be working on one, you know, just for gesture tracking, you know, minority reports type stuff, right? That's happening. But when it happens, you need to be tracking gestures of hands and stuff. So as a field, we're going to be already collecting you know, am I shaking? And you can analyze that over time and it's going to be very accurate. And no one has to do anything beyond what they're already doing. So I think if that's, we want to lay the groundwork to be able to slot that stuff in as soon as possible, because that's how you can get buy-in to the concept of the utility here. Brian. I'd like to ask a question because I think we have some people on the line here who know a lot about um, data and governments and regulations and things Could like that. Could you speak up? Uh, get a little closer to the mic, please. Oh, uh, okay, how about now? I hope that's better. All right, my yeah. question, I wanna ask the group because some of you probably know a lot about data and regulations. And my question is, is it even worth pursuing this in the US? Because it seems to me the US is more like a 50 separate countries all with their own rules. And maybe that's part of the frustration here. Um, it's, US is more like the EU, I guess, in terms of these kinds of things than like a single country. So I just wanted to know what people think. Is it kind of just too hard to start this sort of thing in our population? And maybe we should uh, be- I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, but if you if it starts on a grassroots level and you have individuals who are developing technologies on a biohacker basis, um, that's being fed into the system and allowing the system to collect data from innovators before it becomes recognized that what they're looking at is actually really, really important. Okay, so in there, that regard, I have two more related questions and that's it. One is, um, is the data that's collected on, say, a smartphone, and particularly as someone mentioned, when these phones are pretty soon going to now be having with, have all these 3D LIDAR things and gestures, and like they'll just be pulling your gait all the time and your voice stress, who knows, in addition to whatever health, specific health sensors they have. Is all this data like HIPAA protected data, or is, that only, is it only HIPAA protected Good when you're a doctor? Good totally. question. Yeah. So, Creon, that's a that's a fantastic question. So, what I've been thinking, if you extrapolate far enough, you wind up with the fact that everything that's being observed about you defines a digital identity, and eventually, that digital identity has to have almost the same rights as your physical identity. And the ver the first data to start with for defining that digital identity is your health I health data because it's unambiguously yours, and you should have control over it. But at the we there is going to be a fight between the individual and people who want to collect their data. Yeah. Okay. What, I, what, what I can say is that at least in the documentation they say it's HIPAA compliant. <laughs> for, for HIPAA, you don't have to worry about HIPAA unless you are a covered entity under the HIPAA law, and covered entity in this case implies you are a healthcare provider or a healthcare insurer, which means the private biohacking companies like this aren't covered entities under the traditional health yeah, but is Apple? Well, what usually no. happens here, what, what usually happens here is, uh, I'm not sure if this is what Apple is using, right? But usually a service like this will have the data stored on something like Amazon AWS or whatever. And AWS has all their boxes ticked, or at least they say they do that. If you're storing our system, your data on our system and it, the ins and outs are as such, the system will be compliant with HIPAA. So the International Olympic Committee people I'm working with are very thinking very much about centralized data storage. And they're actually working on mesh oriented uh, data storage so that everybody has their own personal database which they carry around with them and you are not necessarily you're a node you're not necessarily in a central there is no way to actually access everybody's data at the same time or at least there's an awful lot more protections but um, yeah. there's a trend that that is going to drive this market and that is wearables 
and you consider the telephone, your your phone, your cell phone to be a wearable. But um, as we have pulse oximeters on that are tracking data over periods of time and telemetering that data and looking at things like, you know, photographs of what we eat and analyzing that, all of these data streams are going to be coming from devices that have known parameters and known sensitivities and known flaws that will be able to analyze that. Even if the analytical engine that's first looking at the data isn't that sophisticated to start with, it'll get better and better and better over time. And each time exactly. you reanalyze that data, you get new data and you can then have that search, that, that analysis engine look at how the data is changing over time. Yep. Yeah, I, it would be interesting maybe to actually talk with a few people in uh, the crypto industry. I, I just know that, for example, the, the things that I just posted on self sovereign identity, they came from Brian Bailendorf from Hyperledger. And he basically pointed out to a few projects uh, like the ID2020 that is trying to do a kind of like self, uh, uh, self sovereign identity in terms of uh, immunization in the developing world already and in, uh, in, in the, in the uh, Kiva project too. So I think. That would be an interesting one maybe to look into and maybe we could get Brian on board because I think he's actually thought about that. And there are a lot of, I think, at least uh, proposals for how to make this work with zero knowledge proof and federated computation and so on and so forth. So I think there are ways in which uh, this could, in, in principle, could be done. Um, maybe it would make sense to actually consult with him. I have an idea that I'd like to get some feedback on very quickly. Is it possible to tokenize a an idea at the bench that isn't worth putting a company around and having curious people, you know, help you do your research and they get tokens in exchange. And then if your idea grows to be such a, you know, most important enough to worry about going out for outside investment, is it possible to convert those tokens into equity at the point where the company's shares are worth nothing? So that, you know, an individual could maybe invest $10,000 in a research project, and if a company gets out of it, it gets converted into 10% of the shares of nothing. Um, that way you can stay away from the SEC, you know, the tokens being worth anything because they're worth nothing, really, generally. And you still get to reward people for participating in early stage uh, support of early stage research. Anyway, that's a marketplace in the health commons kind of an idea. I proposed that in a plan that I did 30 years ago um, for looking at um, of course you incentivizing did. doctors to um, come up with metrics and the idea would be that they would be conditional equity that would be based on the uh, predictability of that of their proposed idea. Stephen, you're way ahead of me. Congrats. Yeah, that was yeah. that's great. Yeah, but the that's... problem is is that there you know the the regulations are now um, piled higher and deeper and thicker. And so whether or not there's some kind of regulatory yeah. violation, the chances is probably yes, somewhere in the world. Well, I think we don't know that for sure. And I've been thought, I think it's worth, you know, chewing on that bone a little bit and hacking the system if we can, or at least fitting between in the cracks, well, because well, it's gotta work. Yeah, as one thing that's uh, also, no, go for it, Keith. I was just going to say, as a note on tactics here, the where the rubber is about to hit the road here, where I think we might have an angle to try to present some idea like a blockchain-based health record like Estonia, which would solve some of these problems like you mentioned in the chat there, Allison, um, is things like what's going on with Facebook right now. There's a lot of clamoring about like, I should own my data, not Facebook. I should be able to sell it. And that conversation is starting to become a roar right now. And healthcare data is right in that that so that might be the a tactical way that we can sort of like raise these issues just want to point that out yeah and like one thing that may also be a little out there that is perhaps a little bit more similar to what you mentioned steve is like in ai for example in ai safety we once discussed this uh, idea of having using prediction markets uh, like some something like augur or something as an incentive market so for example let's say you wanted to know the answer to something uh, you could kind of like stake uh, stake crypto and basically, you could reap the crypto by uh, giving you a, a, an answer to that question uh, that, that you asked. And like that, you know, you're kind of like indirectly incentivizing uh, kind of like the search for an answer. And then the way that you go about that is, is a different one, right? But if you had like arbiters uh, that, 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 that could make use of, of that information, it would be good. And Metaculous, I know that even without having any crypto at stake, Metaculous as a prediction market works fantastically. 
still, you know, I mean, it is an amazing community that's contributing and stuff, but you know, that's one more out there proposal that we could be using. And uh, yeah, you raise your hand and, and well, then maybe I, call. I just want to say that there's one big potential problem that I think Kevin's um, suggestion might address. And that is the issue of generic end run technologies around proprietary technologies that pretty much everybody who's trying to develop something will be facing that potential economic risk when you silo it and compartmentalize it. And even looking at something like you know, Alzheimer's disease. I was predicting 10 years ago that all of these uh, uh, companies that are investing in Alzheimer's drugs should stop their investment in Alzheimer's drugs because there was a generic technology that was that was emerging that is now um, becoming established. And the same thing is going on with uh, COVID vaccination technologies. You know, millions, if not billions of dollars are going into COVID vaccinations and it's all going to be um, uh, disrupted by intravenous vitamin C therapy. So there's putting it into some kind of a commons with tokens and stuff takes it out of that um, economic loss where you're just predicting the efficacy of a particular approach and not necessarily um, its economic viability. Carl had a question. Oh, you have to mute yourself, yes. So I wanna ask um, about privacy laws and regulation. One of the conversations that's come up, I mean, the problem, current privacy laws make commons much more difficult than they would otherwise be. The thing that's changed in 2020 with COVID is that people are realizing that there are trade-offs between deaths and these privacy laws. And lots of people are expressing the opinion that they'd be happy to accept less privacy in response for a less chance of dying, you know, in trade-off for to get less chance of dying. Um, but I don't see any actual legal movement along those lines. Nobody's actually, you know, writing laws, changing the current privacy laws. So uh, the people who are talking to higher level, you know, people and regulators and lawmakers, like, is this part of a conversation that's going on right now? Is this, something advocacy groups should be plugging, you know, seize the moment to realize that, you know, maybe the amount of privacy we thought we wanted in this wonderful world where everyone was mostly healthy is actually not as not what we want compared to health. Is that a, is that a narrative that you know, I think that's an underlying thing that would promote the long term development of commons. Might that be a false choice, though? I mean, I'm not a super crypto blockchain enthusiast. However, it does seem to me that a decentralized, strongly encrypted kind of, you know, zero knowledge or similar system would in, allow- In an ideal world, Creon, where all of the computer science pieces were perfect, you could possibly get the best of both worlds, but clearly the world we live in today really does have that trade off. And we're not going to fix all the crypto blockchain aspects in the next five years to eliminate the trade-off. Go I, I, ahead, I, yeah. I'll, I'll just say that why is why are people so concerned with privacy and coming from Canada where we don't have to pay health insurance and we don't have to worry about people, you know, using that information against us, it's a much less of a big deal. And yeah, go ahead, Keith. Well, I was just gonna say you're obviously right <laughs> in practice for Americans. I, I, I think we just have this innate like you know, it's don't tread on me kind of angle that's going to get in the way of that, to, to Creon's point. But I do think... Well, oh, but um, the Europeans are even more gung-ho about the privacy stuff. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, to your point, Carl, uh, there, is, there is a narrative that is emerging with some higher-level people that you would know, like Andrew Yang, for example. It's not quite central to the things that he's been talking about, but it's peripherally related, you know blockchain is part of a you know guaranteed minimum income how you track that stuff ways that you you know classic example that happened right now the you know the the one time payments that came to Americans that we want to be more like monthly right but you see it was coming through the mail some people didn't have mailboxes everyone was like why don't we just have a system where we could, it just could just be deposited instantly right and that was surfacing conversations like oh should we have some sort of personal governmental like healthcare record where this money could be deposited. So like these, these conversations are starting to happen like on mainstream news right now amongst politicians. So it's all about, it's all about digital identity. 
it is all about our digital identity. And right now, our digital identity is fragmented into Facebook, Twitter, financial, health, you know, every single dimension of who we are that is now electronic is piecemeal and fragmented. And we need to have a digital identity consolidation. And that digital identity needs to be able to uh, get into legal agreements with those entities that want our data. And can I, the, okay. can I ask a question? Does anybody know whether they've criminalized the voluntary surrendering of um, privacy? So in other words, can a citizen give up their privacy? Um, are they empowered to give up their privacy and donate information about themselves? Um, I'm banking on that. I think the only thing that you're not able to provide is stuff that is directly against the law, you know. Um, but basically, if in, I want America, to... America, freedom of speech implies that you're welcome to speak do to anything you want. private data. Uh, There's no one's going to come get you for that. Yeah, um, yeah the, 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 it's that's not, not, that's not really real anymore on, on so many different levels. I mean, there, there are doctors now who can't say that they've got a cure for COVID infections because um, it's considered misleading the public and therefore it's no, the First Amendment doesn't apply. Right. I, I remember freedom of speech, but I just want to mention one more thing, which is that, um, which is, it does seem to me, I mean, I understand the, the cynicism and the sort of conservative, it's not going to happen and not in the next five years, but things in the digital world can disrupt stuff pretty fast these days. And it, <laughs> not impossible that someone might just deploy some, you know, uh, pseudo identity encrypted, you know, I can release all my private data, but no one knows it's me except me. I mean, this could happen and it could scale and it could happen faster than people anticipate. I definitely want to talk with you, Kriya, about well, that. I don't have to, I don't yeah, know how to one do thing. It. I mean, okay, one thing that, you know, maybe Steve, you have uh, an opinion on as well is like, you know, when we talked about incentivization earlier, what about micropayments? Could you do that uh, in that way? Like, could you, you know, at least incentivize folks by healthy folks who share their data via, via micropayments? And obviously with crypto, you could have that via like Monero or Zcash or mobile coin or whatnot. But you, you don't know, know when it's possible to think. You know, that's huh? the problem with, with volunteers. Yeah, you, don't data. you don't know what it's worth yeah. until after it's analyzed and correlated. And so how would you ever make a, medic, a, a an economic business plan around that kind of uncertainty? It has, well, to, be long, it has to be a long that's term. What, that's what, sorry, that's what Nebula did, one of George Church's companies. They, they actually, you, you fill out more surveys. Um, I don't know exactly what the formula is. And it could be that it's experimental and it could be that they try something and the free market just sort of kicks them out of, the, out of business because they had the wrong formula for paying people who take the time to enter data, the phenotypic data. Um, but but that, that's, that's Nebula's, you know, the, the, the whole genome sequencing company. That's, that's their primary business model. One more quick thing about privacy, uh, since I'm talking about George Church. If, I don't know how many people here have joined the Personal Genome Project, but when you, when you go through the informed consent, which is electronic, it's, there's no face-to-face -face component, it basically says, um, we can't guarantee shit. <laughs> but basically, uh, the, the whole idea of it is that, you know, we, we really can't guarantee any privacy whatsoever. So you, you know, be prepared for this to be entirely public, um, possibly even your name if you put in information like your zip code and I have red hair and blue eyes, detached earlobes, and someone goes in and looks at my genome and so oh yeah, red hair, blue eyes, detached earlobes, kind of tall, scrawny, very pale, red hair, you know, lives in- Brian Florida. Delaney. Bingo, you know, and then <laughs> my bed, and they can look at everything else. Okay. Um, uh, on that so, subject, I just want to—I uh, just want to say, yeah. Stephen's question was a little bit more interesting than it might have sounded. It might—I have to look into it. It might not be legal to just volunteer certain information because I have heard of lawsuits in the past where someone made their genetic data public and it allowed people to discover like their family members and stuff and it caused lawsuits because they didn't want that information out or something. So it could be a more interesting question than it sounded. So I don't know. <laughs> no, ab I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Especially if you, if you catch my grandfather as like the Golden State Killer. I'm going to sue you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Ultimately, if people want the benefit of sharing their data in terms of faster cures, uh, then they need to share it. If they don't want to share their data, then we are going to keep the, the same system that 
we have. So collectively, humanity has to decide what level of privacy they want, put in those protections where possible using new technologies. But if we don't collect the data, and if the data worse isn't accurate that we collect, then it's just, you know, that's the fundamental things. And okay. allowing individuals, free individuals with free consent, especially if you could harness all of the interests of people with Parkinson's right now. And, uh, you know, if they could collect their data every six months and create a data pool from which emergent insights could be gathered, what would those insights be worth and how much would the Parkinson's uh, society then be able to command? Well, Flatiron Health got, what, $500 million for 10,000 records of genomics? You know, this is really, um, I think, a, a individual... Uh, individual agency, free agency discussion for the most part. I think it's also important to note that even without all the work of it actually being done, you can still sort of make a value proposition to the public with dollars and cents. And I don't think that's been done effectively. Like you could say, hey, if we relinquish this amount of privacy, this is what we could get out of it. And this is the value in deaths and money and stuff. And like, what do we think about that? Let's talk about it. That's not a very clear conversation right now, and it could be. All right. Well, I think uh, what we... Let, let, let me make a quick analogy here to, to computers. Um, the, so I worked for a while at Google where we had thousands of computers, and a lot of times a lot of them went wrong, and we needed to figure out what was going on. And everybody in computer science who comes at longevity and biology in general and health they all have the same intuition that biomarkers are super important. And the reason why all the computer science and tech people have that, have that frustration and the first line of, of inquiry that they think is the best is always because they're used to debuggers and they're used to being able to in instantly query any internal state of any computer and computer program. And the way that diagnosing, when you have thousands of computers and you need to diagnose issues, sometimes like when you have lots and lots of people, you can take you know, not great markers and uh, use statistics and figure out what's going on. And there's a sort of a trade-off where the better your internal query ability is on internal markers of what actually is going on, the fewer samples you actually need. So though there are these things coming along, like Keith was talking about with automatic gesture recognition and telling about shaking and all, these are really high level functional things um, at the, you know, they're somewhat distinct from these better and better biomarkers coming along. Um, the idea of a data commons really has, can either be broad and with not great markers, or it can be, you know, not very many and, but with much, much deeper stuff. And it really is a trade-off there. A lot of these issues can be gotten around with a really, really great set of internal assays that really get at things closer and closer to, I can go every intermediate step. And as we get more of those, there might be, you know, so it's going to be messy. Like Brian's, um, you know, tragedy of the unused data, there's always going to be unused data. And, you know, there's going to be multiple of these commons efforts. I can't believe how many have gone through the chat uh, in this session. It's clear that the smart people and knowledgeable people here know about a lot more of them than I had realized or thought about all at one time. Um, but... Uh, as we get more of these efforts, I think there's going to be trade-offs where there's some people trying to really collect huge numbers of people and others where it's like a, a more targeted set of hundreds or thousands, but with some really amazing, like Kevin's uh, metabolomics panels, for example, where you get much more detail. And so that's an interesting trade-off. I think everyone should keep in mind whenever they're discussing whatever these biomarkers or commons are. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, what uh, I want to move on next, maybe just for like the final minutes, is uh, kind of people just giving an update if there is any project that they're working on right now and related to aging and COVID that they would either like another pair of eyes on or collaborators on or uh, just want to make the group aware that that's happening, that if there's any new research out or something. So get that ready uh, and either raise your hand or um, tell me in the chat and I'll. Uh, I'll take you on in, uh, in just a second for about like 30 seconds or so. And maybe if, if you just want to kind of like drop things with, with the group. I do want to, uh, before we move on, so to give you time to think, um, have like uh, maybe the kind of like panelists uh, have like a final say of like, hey, if there's anything actionable uh, coming out of this, what would that be after the session, right? For example, I could take on if, if people thought it was useful. I talked to the 
crypto folks that I had on in previous Foresight Salons on self-sovereign identity in relation to contact uh, tracing and testing I do to COVID-19 and just see, hey, is there anything that you know of? Uh, are there any structures or prototypes that are already out there that you're experimenting with that could be applicable to a health comment? So that's one thing that I could be doing uh, if that was deemed useful. Uh, what are other things? If people thought what I was saying was at all interesting and worthy of further intellectual pursuit, I could probably write something up in how there's an analogy in what's already being done in, for example, data that's being gathered and processed in other fields like the entertainment industry and how that could be a model for certain aspects of what we can do and maybe use that as an outreach endeavor to get more large institutions interested in what we're doing. <laughs> it sounds my, great. I would love to read it. Yes. So my, my entire goal with Open Cures is the creation of a multidimensional, multi-omic human database, sort of like GenBank, but filling in the gaps with proteomics and metabolomics that everybody can then use in parallel to actually work on interventions instead of having to recreate the wheel and measure biomarkers over and over and over again. So multiple entities, so all we need is to create these data standards and I would love to talk to people who have that sort of global picture. I do have a potential opportunity to work with the International Olympic Committee and I am working with FASEB right now on that exact question and they do wanna present a proposal in the next month actually to their board and start working uh, with the NIH on data standards and data sharing. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be discussed and I certainly am not competent and I would love to help, to have help, so. Uh, I'd like to add that there might be a way, I mean, we were mentioning micropayments and I was thinking of, of the idea that, you know, back from the ancient days where, um, individuals would participate in a company and sell their data to the company so that it became a asset of the company and therefore the privacy rights that would be the, the individuals would then become the legal rights of the company the umbrella under under which they were organized and so in a sense the if somebody were to steal the data or something like that there's a big financially sound organization that can then go after whoever it was that was uh, stealing the data and potentially, um, you know, resolve the issue without the individual having to press their legal case directly. So if the individuals deposit their data in a bank, sort of, so to speak, then the bank becomes the legal uh, curator. And, and if it's just a dollar, it's not like it's going to be a big financial burden. Right. All right. Sounds Great. Anyone, any other final comments of any panelists on actionable steps on this? Um, I have a off the wall question. Um, can anyone think of a really good first indication uh, if I were screening for drugs in African killifish, which are a short lived uh, vertebrate model of aging? Um, is there a, like a really good disease? Uh, as a proxy for aging that one could go after um, screening in Philly fish. You know, that was a, fine um, answer, but. A, a lot of, a lot of like home aquarium fish are, are susceptible to that fungal infection called ick, right? Yeah. So I wonder if, if there is like a inflammaging immunosenescence phenotype in hmm. standard household pet fish that make them more susceptible to pathological infections of that sort. Awesome. What about, the, cool. what, about the bacteri what about the bacterial uh, skewing of the bacterial populations that I can't remember whose lab it was working on from Stanford. What's her, the, the uh, French, the French lady with the uh, leather boots. I can't remember uh, who, <laughs> what, Stanford. Uh, yeah. Who's the aging researcher? Anne Brunet, Stanford? whatever. Anne Brunet, yes, Anne Brunet. She's always looks so good. <laughs> And uh, but I'll so have what some, Kevin's smoking. <laughs> but some people, so some people in her lab have been working with the short-lived killifish, and they've been looking at genomics of yeah. their bacteria. Kind of. I am in touch. Yeah. Oh, okay, of course you are. Okay, lovely. Well, I think one thing that we could be doing, which has popped up now, maybe for a future meeting, uh, actually compare a few uh, biomarkers uh, in a meeting, and maybe get a few people. Um, work on that and i know that you know previously it has been discussed at the at the beginning of this hey actually figuring out which biomarker to use should itself be a competitive pro, uh, a process and i would broadly agree but maybe we can uh, you know already um, kind of like have that as a discussion topic for future salon 
Um, okay. Five yes. people. Five people on here are actually customers, and they've generated a whole bunch of metabolomic data. Maybe it would be fun to have a metabolomic data discussion, you know, with uh, with our various data points, and use that as a sample. To work cool. Lovely. Okay, I'll follow up on that. Um, and uh, great for not revealing the names. Super. <laughs> um, all right. Next one up, we have a few general updates by people who are working on aging and COVID. 19 related things we have louise um, so far is the only one if you want to like share an update as well then just ping me in the chat or raise your hand and i'll uh, make sure we get to you before we close it out okay louise what's new with you oh hi guys um so we are um developing nano scavengers called nanots and there is an application in inflammaging which is which i've talked about some publicly but we are moving forward with it and these are, are um, to deplete um, the top three inflammatory cytokines, which are TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6, they come up again and again in both chronic and acute um, autoimmune autoinflammatory diseases, including COVID-19 sepsis, which is the main cause of mortality and morbidity in, in COVID. So it's not the infection per se, it's the cytokine storm triggered by the infection. There are obviously DMAR drugs against these cytokines they all reduce immune competence and are contraindicated with an active infection, particularly a respiratory infection. But scavenging these things with a shielded nanoparticle that does not affect membrane forms of the cytokine, you can deplete the target without affecting immune competence. So we're, we're moving forward with that, raising money for that. And we've already got a version against TNF-alpha itself working in mice. So that's one thing we're working on. I also just did um, a course at um, AAI, the American Association of Immunology, it was 50 hours of lecture over a week. And there was one thing that came up in one of the lectures that I thought was really interesting, talking about how B cells neutralize circulating pathogenic targets like viruses. One of the techniques that they use is agglutination. So they release antibodies, which bind to the target. Of course, there's two arms on the antibody. So it, it'll bind multiple targets, and then another antibody will bind multiple targets and you end up with a ball of agglutinated antibodies and viral copies. And that ends up, because of size and immunogenicity, it lands on the radar of the immune system and it gets cleared out in an accelerated fashion. That's how it should work. So we're exploring an agglutination strategy where we would coat nanoparticles with antibodies against the spike protein, basically to create an agglutination phenomenon where you have, these are nanoparticles that are the same size as the viral copy coated with spike protein. So you end up with a, a big ball of nanoparticles and viral copies lands on the immune system radar, accelerated clearance of viral copies. It's not a cure. It's just a way of tilting the battle toward the immune system. So those are just a quick update on a couple of things we're working on that are related to both COVID and inflammation. Lovely. That was a very uh, aesthetically beautiful, beautifully <laughs> described uh, and, and very, yeah, very, very visual. Okay, Steve, you have another update. And if you want to go next, then just let me know in the chat. Um, okay. Um, there's some really interesting stuff that's been happening in various fringe markets and fringe research programs that um, are have really impressed me. And one of them is recognizing that most of the mortality figures that are associated with pre-existing conditions and, and COVID mortality are related to um, redox potentials and the strength of the antioxidant defense system and the redox buffering systems um, that support it. And I think that this should be a focus of future um, aging um, uh, research to, to identify which of the biomarkers are associated with redox potential. Um, second, it looks like there's a huge uh, mechanism at play that hasn't been realized possibly until now that as oxidative stress challenges vitamin C and glutathione, um, that the ability of glutathione to, to maintain its binding of mercury gets compromised. And so glutathione does two different jobs. One is, is a redox buffering agent. Another one is, is that it's a mercury detoxifying agent. And it's only the reduced glutathione that can bind the mercury so that 
if the redox couple of glutathione starts shifting towards oxidative states, it releases mercury and mercury poisons the mitochondria. It causes massive disruption of electron transport in the mitochondria. It, um, and it, it triggers Alzheimer's disease and uh, possibly maybe the actual mechanism of sudden infant death syndrome. So um, I'm just dropping that on you guys. <laughs> That almost screams like a topic for a whole session, I think. I want to finish with saying this is also an invitation to everyone. If you have updates that are relevant for this group, please feel free to share them with the group uh, by just emailing it to the whole Google group. And I think a few people have started doing this, which I really welcome. I will tell you when it's too much. Don't worry about it. For now, I just want to get you uh, going on sharing things with each other. For now, thank you so, so much, everyone, for hopping on. It was really fantastic. And I hope to see you all next Friday.